We're gonna go deep into strength training for powerlifting, and we're gonna start right now. Okay, so what is powerlifting? You know, what, what does everybody think about? Everybody usually will think about, you know, the legend, rest in peace, uh, Louis Simmons, coaching some of the strongest freaks in the entire world uh, back in the day at Westside Barbell. Or for me, one of my first memories regarding powerlifting is watching uh, Gene Richlack at my local high school and around Pennsylvania bench press, you know, 800 pounds, 900 pounds, a thousand pounds for the, being the first person to bench press a thousand pounds and seeing just how large he was as a human being. And that's where we can go, right? We're looking at athletes that are going to be doing deadlift. They're going to be doing the back squat and they're going to be doing the bench press. And the energy systems that they're going to be using are going to be the alactic energy system or the glycolytic energy system. So they're doing anything typically between you know five to ten seconds or maybe if they're doing a little bit higher rep sets for training to build a bigger base they might be doing 30 to 60 seconds and then here and there you'll see some powerlifting coaches that might implement some steady state cardio just to help recovery just to help lean some guys out in certain weight classes that they're in as well so we also have to understand that there are specific weight classes where they execute the back squat the deadlift and the bench press and then that takes us into the necessary mobility we have to have some semblance of mobility we also have to have really sound structural integrity to enhance recovery to make sure that we're preventing injuries and then so that we can hit optimal technique and technique is really what rules in powerlifting there's a couple factors behind this if we can execute the technique that we need specific to our body as well as possible for each lift. So think about the technique in the back squat. We need to squat to 90 degrees, depending on the federation, just below 90 degrees, drive up as rapidly as possible, wait to get cued to come back into the stand. Those are the key basics behind the movement, but we have to find the groove. We have to find the pattern. We have to find what's our shin angle going to be? What's our, our hip angle to our torso? What's that going to be? And then take the deadlift. We've got a pull from the floor, hold really good tension so that the bar stays as tight to center as mass as possible and that our knees can lock out to execute the finish of the deadlift. And then same thing with the bench press. We need to know, okay, how can we unrack this as best as possible? How can we work through that groove on the eccentric? And then how can we feel that nice strong pause as we lead to driving concentrically through the finish of the movement. So technique rules, we've got to have mobility. We understand the energy systems that are involved and we know where we have to work towards to enable our body to lift as much as possible. So that's going to take us into that first key exercise. Now we're going to go over, okay, let's focus on strength training for the deadlift. Let's focus on training for the back squat. Let's focus on training for the bench press and then help you guys understand what are the best ways that we can strength train for powerlifting? So when we're discussing the deadlift, some of the key things we have to think about initially are, okay, what technique are we gonna be using? Are we gonna be doing a sumo dead or are we gonna be doing a conventional dead? Typically what I would recommend if I have a little bit shorter legs, uh, I would go sumo, right? And if I have a little bit longer limbs, I typically recommend uh, going more conventional. I think longer limbed uh, individuals tend to pull a bit better with their lower back and with their hamstrings with that conventional stance. So identify what technique are we going to be using. And then as we execute this technique, if we have our athletes, we have to focus on the actual pattern of the technical movement. So as the bar moves off the floor to the knee, and then as the bar passes the knee and the individual locks out their hips and their knees, where do we see weakness in the technique? Where does the technique sort of fall by the wayside? Maybe the bar starts to creep forward, the individual gets pulled onto their toes, or they start to hitch like crazy. Where does that individual lose the groove, essentially? Okay, so identify that from a technical perspective. And then we take that technical weakness and we start to identify, okay, at these positions, we're starting to see muscular weaknesses, okay? So there might be a lack of coordination. There might be, you know, the hamstrings are weak or the quads are terribly weak on lockout or the lower back, everything gets pulled forward. Their butt shoots up super, super high. So we start to identify based off of our technical models. All right, here's where the technical patterning is suffering. And then here's where the muscular weaknesses are based. 
And then that helps us get to that next step. We can start to employ different movements for two to three periods of training blocks and really start to target specific areas. So, you know, for example, if we notice a lower back, a posterior chain lacks coordination, we can really, really load uh, the reverse hyper. Uh, if we notice that someone's hamstrings, they just get really, really sore hamstrings and they're not as fast in the lockout, then we can really start to target hamstring specific exercises. Then if we see someone that maybe their mid back struggles to, to finish that lockout at the top, they start to hitch like crazy. We can do, you know, good mornings with a safety squat bar, something like this to really help that lockout with the mid back strength. And now we can start to piece all this together to figure out, okay, how often can we deadlift? What are the patterning problems? What are the technical problems that we're looking at? And even attacking the point of, hey, you can't deadlift more than every 10 days or every two weeks. And now realizing, it's a technical movement. We need to be deadlifting more than every 10 days. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're deadlifting at max attempt every 10 days, but it could be, you know, on day one, you're focusing on pushing the, that absolute strength, you're pushing that weight. And then on day four or day five, we're doing 10 sets of doubles or 10 sets of triples, just really trying to feel the groove, feel that pattern, which in turn is going to help your muscles coordinate better when you go back to that max uh, effort day. So the big keys behind behind strength training for the deadlift is, again, use a technical model to establish whether or not you should be doing a sumo or a conventional movement, okay? Then find where the technical weaknesses are. Do you struggle with a lockout? Do you struggle off the floor? You know, whatever that might be. Do you struggle around the knee? Do you hitch? Then that step further would be find the actual weak muscles. Is there coordination issues? And really target and isolate those, you know, 12 to 16 weeks out from your comp so that you can really build those weak points and then lead to those monster PRs. And now that's gonna take us into the back squat. So we're getting into the back squat. That first key factor that we have to know is what federation are we gonna be competing in? What federation that we're competing in will really determine the depth of our back squats. Some federations might allow a little bit higher back squats. Watch video of Ray Williams. He's squatting deep, okay? So now we can see, all right, now we've got to squat a little bit deeper. We've got to get basically ass to grass. So now we know that inside of our training and that's where we can get into, is Ray Williams our technical model or is someone more like Mark Bell, you know, but depending on the federation that we're in, we have to, to be aware. We've established that technical model and now we can really start to roll. Okay, so now we establish that technical model and we work on our tech Technique. And then as we're working on our technique, we can start to see, okay, uh, we've got ankle mobility problems or our lower back's really weak. Our quads are really weak, so that should be addressed. We should be training our quads, but we also have to remember, all right, if, if our quads are weak, we should probably should go full steam with low bar as what we're gonna be using as our technical model. But when we're in training, you know, 12 to 16 weeks out, we train a little bit more high bar to target those weak quads. So now we can start to see, all right, uh, uh, our technical pattern should be X or Y, and our training should be, you know, Y or Z, you know, whatever. And then that's gonna help us lay out how we can actually attack the technique and the muscles based around the back squat training. I typically do like to recommend, you know, if you're 16 weeks out from a comp, right? If you're 16 weeks out, you train high bar and minimal amount of gear. Uh, if you're 12 weeks out, you could still train high bar. Now, as you get to eight to 10 weeks out, somewhere in that time frame, that's when you can shift to low bar and that's when you can really start to focus in on that technique of a low bar back squat. And then you really, during that time, you focus on those tight areas that you're dealing with, you know, ankles, knees, lower back, whatever that might be. And then on top of that, if you have someone who's a little slow out of the bottom position or they're slow in the lockout, you can start to use on your dynamic day. So let's say day one uh, or day two, you're, you're focusing on pushing, you know, max effort back squats or you're, maybe you're in a hypertrophy phase, you're doing five sets of five back squats, you know, you're, you're 12 weeks out, but you're a little bit sluggish, you're, you feel slow. Now you start to implement some plyometric movements later on in the week. So day four, day five, now you're doing, you know, hurdle hops or seated box jumps or, or stair jumps, something along these lines to help with the rate coding, to help with that power production at a higher rate of force development, essentially. If, if we can train plyometrics along with, you know, some dynamic work, think about using the contrast method then where we might hit, you know, a fast back squat, double rest two minutes, and then go do stair jumps. That's gonna enable us 
to really learn how to have greater speed and greater force development, which will help us when we're under the bar in a max effort situation. And then this takes us into the bench press. And, and, and the bench press, the, the template's gonna be very similar where we have to identify how long's the pause period gonna be. Are we gonna be wearing gear? Are we gonna be wearing a shirt or no shirt? Okay, a bench shirt or no bench shirt. And then how does that influence our technical focus? What are we gonna be doing during training as we work through the eccentric groove so that we can establish the groove so that as we get heavier, we're more effective in proper recruitment. You know, some individuals might have a much tighter elbow tuck. Some individuals might let their elbows flare a little bit more depending upon limb length. And if we're training that specifically, that's where we can really start to focus on our accessory work as well. So we can see with the technique that we're developing, okay, I want, you know, I'm a, a little bit longer limbed. My triceps tend to be extremely strong. My chest is not that strong. So further out, from competition, I'm gonna focus, you know, eight to 12 weeks on developing my chest movements. I wanna focus on uh, one and a quarter reps. I wanna focus on slow eccentric, you know, really slow just above my chest to try and figure out how when I pause, I can get as much recruitment out of my pecs as possible. Because we know if I can get six to eight inches off my chest, if I can get, you know, just a little bit off my chest, once my triceps kick into full gear, now they're gonna blow up and I'm gonna execute that finish. But if we take some other examples where maybe the triceps are terribly weak, but people are very strong off their chest, well, now we know, okay, we've got to work in that 16 week period or 12 week period. We have to develop their tricep strength. And that's where it goes into, you know, finding the weaknesses in the athlete's groove when they're benching and then training with various grips to identify, okay, if I go a little bit wider, that might target a little bit more of my pecs. If I go a little bit more narrow, that's gonna target a little bit more of this athlete's triceps. And then you can say, all right, we have the technique, we see where their weak points are, now we use various grips and various dumbbells, kettlebells, whatever it might be to target these areas. And then once we're eight to 10 weeks out, we can start doing some max effort work with a shirt, we can start doing much more heavy work with pauses, we might do some rack work as long as we're really focused on lighting up our pecs before we press off the rack, and now that leads to better performance on the bench when we're inside that meet. And one of the interesting parts behind bench pressing is that the bench press responds very well to hypertrophy work, okay? So doing sets of seven, sets of 12 in that range, the bench responds really, really well to that. The bench also responds very well to good speed work. So, you know, pad benches are a phenomenal way to get some good speed work in. So now looking at that and saying, all right, at certain points of my different phases, I need more speed work or I need more hypertrophy work based off of my technical weaknesses, based off of my own morphological weak points, based, you know, based off my limb lengths, and that's gonna help execute the bench with a little bit higher poundage, which ultimately will help you become a champion. Okay, so that takes us into our strength template, right? So we've got the strength template here, and what we like to do is focus on day one, okay? So day one, we're gonna do a speed pull. So that could be, uh, I like to use, you know, Contrary to some American powerlifting coaches, I like to use things like a clean high pull. I like to use snatch pull to target. These are a lot of the speed pulls that help me pull 705 pounds. Okay, so I like to do some speed pull movements earlier in the week, day one. Day two, we're gonna get into a strength movement. That's where we can execute the back squat. So depending on how far out we are, now we use low bar, high bar, uh, we use pauses, we use different variations, double bounces, anything that you need to use to increase your overall performance with the back squat. And then after we execute that heavier strength movement, and it could be some hypertrophy work in there as well, now we're getting into the accessories. So remember, we need to identify the weak points in someone's technique and someone's musculature, and that's where we start to target these things with the accessory period. So that finishes up day one. Remember, explosive dynamic pull, then a strength movement, usually gonna be our back squat, and then we get into those accessories to target those weaknesses. Now in day two, we are going to also start the day off with an explosive movement. This could be a med ball bench. This could be a behind the neck push press, uh, which is great for someone who struggles with the lockout. This could be even a power jerk. Okay, we wanna make the nervous system as coordinated as possible. I like to think about training power lifters essentially very similar to how we train shot putters. Some of the shot putters in this world right now, think about Darlin Romani, think about Joe Kovacs. These are the strongest guys in the world, literally. 
Like there's evidence of these guys repping 600 plus pounds on bench press with no gear on, zero gear and just hammering this because of the way they train, because of how explosive they are and how coordinated they are. So I like to start off day two, an explosive movement. Then we can get into that strength-based movement. Then we can get into the bench press. We can get into, you know, do we need to focus on hypertrophy? Do we want to do a, an incline bench or whatever that might be? And then following that, we want to target weak points. We want to focus on accessory movements that might be, you know, dumbbell external rotations to make sure our shoulders stay healthy. Some more rowing work, maybe even some sled pull work with a rope, anything that's going to light up our lats it's going to help strengthen our lower back and help us be stronger from a structural integrity point to make our execution of the bench press that much more bulletproof now day three we're going to go into all right are we going to focus on a speed pull are we going to focus on a max effort pull typically i would say maybe you warm up with a little bit more of a speed pull and then you get into that max effort and then that second exercise is typically going to be a squat variation okay so this could be a zombie squat. This could be even a single leg squat if we're further out from the competition. It could be, you know, pause front squats. Anything along those lines is going to help mobility, target weaknesses, give us a little bit more time under tension. And then again, after we execute that with a little bit more hypertrophy, now we're getting into those accessories. Accessories here on day three are going to help us, you know, with recovery. I love reverse hyper for straight up recovery. Sled work. Uh, sled pull forward, sled pull backward, sled pushing, anything to help strengthen our knees, strengthen our ankles. This is where we continuously build and enhance our weak points within the entire chain. And then going into day four, we're gonna do more explosive upper body work or even some stability work. You know, think about something as simple as chaos push-ups. These are exercises that are gonna help wake up that nervous system and really attack everything as we lead into the strength movement or the hypertrophy movement of the upper body so it could be let's focus on you know a behind the neck power jerk right so let's just really light up that nervous system and then we get into pushing dumbbell bench presses but we're doing straight up hypertrophy we're 12 weeks out we're 16 weeks out let's do five sets of 12 let's do six sets of 12 really build a ton of volume with dumbbell work and we're doing that with some back exercise maybe it's a bent over row maybe it's a, a chest supported row with a barbell and we're trying to really just build the actual contractile structure of the muscle, okay? And then that takes us again back into those accessories where we're looking at direct weak points. Do we have someone whose chest is weak? Maybe we do some pre-fatigue. Do we have someone whose triceps are weak? Uh, we, we try and focus on floor benches to, to actually have that transfer really well to the bench press. So to recap everything, if we can understand that we need to know the movement pattern, okay, the movement pattern establishes our technique. We need to know the individual and how their technique is influenced by their musculature, by their limb length, okay? What type of technique are they gonna be using? What are their tendencies? Where are their weak points in their technique? How can we use uh, different accessories to target those weak points? How can we use different technical cues to target those weak points to enhance their muscular patterning, okay? And then that's gonna lead us into hypertrophy does phenomenal work in increasing max strength. So does dynamic effort work like plyometrics, like speed benches, uh, like power jerks, things along these lines. They can go a long way with powerlifting. And we also have to target these specific joints that will take a toll with really good mobility work. Our lower back, our hips, our knees, our ankles, our shoulders. Work on those areas with mobility to improve your overall recovery. And then plan 12 to 16 weeks out. Once we plan 12 to 16 weeks out, that makes it a lot easier to execute, to hit those PRs at your powerlifting competition. So we've got two things for you to do if you're struggling with powerlifting, you're struggling with designing a program, you're struggling with those templates, okay? First, we've got a template that we put together that you can click on the link in the description, you can head over to garagestrength.com, you can put in your email address, and you can download just a basic template for one week, okay? So it's gonna help you lay out, all right, I need this exercise here, I need this style of exercise here. So that template's phenomenal. Then after you download that template, you'll get another email asking if you want to pick up the strength training for powerlifting. So now you can see, all right, how is this template here? And then this is the actual programming around strength training for powerlifting that overlays this template. Then, then you can use the program to help execute your lifts and lead to bigger PRs. And remember, always cultivate your power. Peace.